Um, what I thought I'd do is I'd present, um, in terms of a little fable, a tale of four vein graphs to illustrate several of the decision-making points that come to all of us as we, as we deal with vein graphs. So this first one, hopefully, is the simple one. This is a 69-year-old male veteran. He's had a prior cabbage. He comes in with an on -stemmy. He goes to calf. He's got really not much other than this focal lesion in a vein graft down in the distal part of the body of the graft. Fairly small target vessel, a little bit diffusely diseased. And uh, I think it, most of us would probably treat this vein graft in that setting with an on -stemmy. So this, because this is a right graft, we tend to use a multi-purpose guide, use embolic protection uh, essentially every time. Stent goes up, filter comes out, nice result. I don't think there's any argument, hopefully, although the marketing data would suggest that people don't necessarily believe in embolic protection, but I hope people realize that this is the perfect case for embolic protection, stent, and get out. So the lesson on the first patient is when it's simple and focal and the alternatives are not, that right coronary was uh, completely occluded all the way down, um, treat the SVG. And when you do treat it, treat it right. Use a proper guide catheter for the vein graft that you're treating through or treating and use embolic protection. And there are a couple different options on the market. You should get familiar with at least one of them. So case number two, this is another patient about the same age, 70 year old guy, prior cabbage. He's had multiple prior PCIs. Um, his cast shows a patent left main into cirque, a native right coronary that's patent and a lima to the LED. His culprit for this presentation is going to be a vein graft to the ramus. And this is a case that actually one of my colleagues did initially. So here's this uh, left main into circumflex. Um, and you can see, as we look at it in the ARIO view, there's a stent dangling up there in space. And that, I'll just tell you, is going to go to a large ramus branch. We've got a uh, lima to the LED. There's a little bit of apical very distal LED disease, but this thing is patent. So their thought was, this is actually severe ISR. Somebody else had previously treated this. ISR, and a lot of, a lot of thinking is if it's ISR, you don't necessarily need embolic protection. You can just go in here quick and easy and, and treat this. Okay, so that was the plan. Uh, here it is in another view. See, it's very tight. They go in with a little bit undersized balloon. Um, a good choice of guide, I'll comment. That's an Amplatz guide, a very good choice for a left graft. They pre-dilate it. Everything's looking great. Lots of flow there. You go to put the stent in, and then they take this picture after the stent. And so if anyone thinks that you can look at an ISR lesion and say, I don't need embolic protection, you should think twice. So they struggled for a while. Patient got pain and soft pressure and everything. And But after lots of um, working with doses of nitroglycerin, nicardipine, and so on, eventually got this flow at the end of the case and, and got out of dodge. So the same patient, six months later, comes back with return of his symptoms. Turns out he has recurrent ISR in the same exact spot. So this time, we didn't want to be bitten twice by that same vein graft, and we decided to abandon the vein graft and open the native vessel, but use the vein graft to our advantage. So here we have two um, Amplatz guides, we've got a microcatheter and wire in the vein graft that's going to the ramus, and we've got a guide that we're gonna use in the, in the native left circulation. So here's um, an injection into the native left. You see the wire has traversed down through the lesion and is coming back in the target vessel toward the occlusion point um, of the ramus. So uh, just another view on that. So we're working away on this and making some progress. We've got some anagrade gear in here with a support catheter and a wire so we can, uh, the idea being that we're going to probably do a reverse cart here to connect these two. And the patient starts developing 8 out of 10 chest pain and ST changes. Well, we're working through a very tight lesion and he's very dependent on that. So we had to pull out, abandon that for a little bit, balloon it just enough with an undersized balloon to get some flow, and then resume the procedure. And at the end, we've I won't show the details of the reverse cart, but we have a reasonable result confirmed by IVIS um, that we have well-expanded stent in the left main um, reconstituting the native ramus, abandoning the vein graft. So the lessons from that is some vein grafts are best abandoned, but they do make great retrograde conduits for reverse cart 
um, CTO PCI. So a third example, this is a patient, 67-year-old man with a positive MPI, some angina, EF that's a little bit depressed. He's also had prior cabbage. Um, he's got patent uh, native right coronary, a lima to his LED, a CTO of his circumflex, and a vein graft to the circumflex that's 100% occluded. So when we look at this, this is dual injections, again with um, dual guide catheters, dual groin access. He's actually got probably native, originally had left dominant circulation. This is probably a non-dominant right, but it's developed such a large collateral you almost can't tell. Um, and so he's collateralizing the circumflex largely from the right coronary, and you can see the stump of the vein graft in that obtuse marginal that backfills a little bit. So um, believing that collaterals are never adequate uh, to prevent ischemia, we tried to open this integrate, and as you see on the initial attempts, the wire goes offline and we're in a subintimal space, certainly not in, in true lumen here, integrate. So we try, and I'll just show both of these, if they'll both play. Um, the one on the left is, of course, that original angiogram. And we're trying, we thought we'd try to traverse that big, huge collateral and get to the circumflex that way. And I don't know if you can appreciate, down in the corner on the original image, there's almost a loop-de-loop -loop, right as the vessel um, folds over on itself. And we just could not get a wire and a support catheter to track through there, so I had to abandon that. So um, this is just going to be a fluoro save. Here we are, we'll go, do a little puff into the vein graft. This is a completely occluded vein graft. This is the other end of the one that goes to the OM that we saw filling in the other way. So I'm just, I just saved the whole fluoro thing to show it's really not that um, big of a deal usually to get a stiff wire. I don't remember which this was, maybe a Gaia third or a uh, Compianza Pro or sort of the typical ones we'll use with a support catheter, a little bit of pushing, a little bit of torquing, and you can penetrate the cap. Um, and, and make some progress into there. Then you can bring in the support catheter, which is what we'll do here. And you can switch to a wire of your choice. Often all, the, all it takes once you penetrate the cap is maybe a Pilot 50 or something like that. You can get um, down the vein graft and it's not, uh, it's not as challenging as a lot of people think it might be. Bring the support catheter down. Now we, I like to inject, once I get most of the way down, I like to inject and see what's down there a little controversial, I guess, but I, I like to see um, that stump that I saw before and make sure everything's connected. So notice we've parked the wire in the antegrade, um, the one that's offline, we're um, just injecting through the retrograde <coughs> through this occluded vein graft. And then again, after that injection, uh, again, just a fluoro save, just showing that we're, we can wire down from that point in the mid graft and easily make the turn and go back up toward the other wire. So it's, um, and then uh, in this case, we were thinking we were going to do reverse cart, but actually the wire went all the way up. You'll see us fiddling with the retrograde wire. We're pushing, the wire goes into the aorta. So we just pull the wire back a little bit and redirect, and the wire goes, you'll see in a second, straight into the guide catheter. So um, sometimes you get lucky and there's no need to even do the reverse cart step. The wire will go in right now, I think. Um, so once the wire goes in there, you can just externalize the wire and work integrate in balloon and stent, and, and there's the final result. So actually a fairly expedient, um, not, not a super long case. Um, so not all large collaterals can be traversed safely. A lot of times these collaterals look really juicy and big, but you can't really get through them. And 100% occluded vein grafts can be a great retrograde conduit for um, PCI of a CTO. Um, remember, though, that the completely occluded vein graft itself is still considered a class three by the AHA. I think there are limited circumstances where you would actually open that vein graft and try to get a durable result when it's been completely occluded. And then the final um, patient that I think illustrates some other decision-making points is this is an 80-year-old veteran with angina and a non-STEMI, prior cabbage again. And this patient has a series of issues. So a patent left main into the circumflex, which is an important vessel for him with a high grade lesion in that left main. Uh, a lima to the LED with a 100 millimeter left subclavian artery um, gradient, tight lesion in the left subclavian. 
and then a vein graft to the ramus with high grade stenosis. And I don't know what your practices are like, but often we get sort of one crack at these patients and we want to do the most benefit that we can in, in their visit to the cath lab. So here's that left main, uh, tight lesion. It looks tight in this view, looks even tighter in the REO view. And you can see there's a circumflex coming off that little bit of competitive flow coming down a septal perforator there. And in the LAO cranial, you see a good delineation of what that left main issue is. Technically protected because there's a lima to the LED, but as I mentioned, not really protected because there's a subclavian lesion, which is here. So um, again, high grade, when we crossed it with a catheter, the pressure was 100 millimeters lower on the other side of it than it was on the proximal side. And this, once we engaged it, you see it's a fairly large LED. This is collateralizing the PDA, but that's gonna be for another day. <laughs> you can't do everything in one day. Um, and here's the native right that's occluded. Um, this is uh, an, another vein graft that's occluded. So here's the, here's the culprit vein graft to the ramus. So we could do something fancy like on the prior case and go through that and try to reconstitute the path to the ramus, but we have a lot of things to do for this guy. And so we first decided we better fix the left main. So we've got an amplatz and a guide. We couldn't get the guide to be exactly the right length. So we actually used an undersized amplatz left, an AL1 with a guide liner to be able to adjust the length and get just optimal engagement and be able to pull out as we need to to do the left main intervention. So I won't belabor that, but that's the final after we've stented that and IVUS that and everything. Then we did the left subclavian. Um, I like to use self-expanding when I can in this location. Um, put a self-expanding in there. You could argue maybe it could have been in a little further. We're of course trying to stay away from the lima. And the important thing is that the gradient went from 100 pre to zero gradient. So don't need angiographic perfection if you make the gradient go away on a, on a subclavian. So then we finally turn to this vein graft. And now this is, um, could argue the one of the more straightforward lesions of this patient. So again, put a filter wire in, you can see in the mid graft, uh, position a stent, deploy the stent, um, post dilate, retrieve the filter, and a very nice final result. So in this case, in two views, it looks very nice. So sometimes as part of a complex clinical picture and a complex treatment plan, PCI of the vein graft is the simplest and most expedient and even though we're, we've got a lot going on, you notice we still used the embolic protection and still went to the AMPLATS guide, I think it's, it's a helpful thing. So to summarize all that, I would say don't be afraid to treat the vein graft when it's appropriate, but do it appropriately with embolic protection whenever possible, and we can talk about that. And sometimes it's best when, especially you've been bitten by that vein graft before, to just bypass the bypass and go open the native vessel. Um, a vein graft can often facilitate PCI of the native CTO, even if that vein is 100% occluded, and I think that's a good example. It goes very easily most of the time, and it's very efficient. And um, vein graft PCI is often an expedient choice, so I'll stop there and take questions. Thanks. Thank you so much. Uh, we're open uh, for discussion. So uh, the IFU for a lot of these embolic protection filters says keep it in the you know, uh, graft itself. Do you ever put it in the native uh, vessel? Yeah, so that can be a challenge, obviously, when the lesion is very distal, near the distal anastomosis. Sometimes you don't have room to deploy your filter without it being in the native vessel, and probably a lot of people have experience with that. You can sometimes put it into the native vessel and have the hoop be right at the anastomosis. Occasionally, I've put it into the native vessel, all the way in the native vessel if the lesion involves the, the, the touchdown site. You have to recognize that it doesn't necessarily protect the other branch. You know, there may be a retrograde limb on that, and so you have to choose the one you want to protect, and you, don't, you get incomplete protection, but yeah. Are you using any proximal protection, or that, is that out of the market now? It's out of the market. Yeah, the we... Market. It was great to tell. Done. Yeah, the Proxis was a great thing. We were part of that trial, and I'm, it's too bad we don't have that as an option. There's a question from the audience. So, <clears throat> Rick, uh, this is Sal Arin from UT Houston. Thank you very much. Great talk. So, quick question, not directly related to the, the vein graft intervention per se, it's the opposite direction. 
when you fix that CTO and you still have a vein graft that's hanging, when do you decide to close it or coil it? I've never done it, though I'm told by my teachers and my proctors that perhaps you should, if you see brisk flow in the vein graft after you're done, and if it's on its way out, then just coil it on the way out. Your thoughts? Yeah, I hear that all the time. I, my preference is to, especially if it's a totaled vein graft, like that one example I showed, I, um, I don't see any need to coil a totaled one. Usually at the end, it's got really no flow through it anyway. Um, and then that other example where we were working through a tight lesion, I try not to treat that tight lesion because I just want to leave that with minimal flow through it and let it do what it's going to do. I use, I'm not sure I've bought in totally to the idea of coiling them off to preserve my result in the native vessel. That You're putting a lot of confidence in your, I mean, I, I don't know. I, I, other people I, I don't think anybody knows. I mean, I've seen examples of badly degenerative vein grafts that were coiled after a successful CTO PCI. The patient comes back many months later for other issues, and the vein grafts still open with flow <laughs> in it. Uh, so I don't, I don't think anybody knows. Cool. Thank you. Any role for laser? For example, in that case with instant restenosis, um, you think that you could have a laser to vaporize uh, the plaque? So that's that's, that's a good question. I think the biology inside a vein graft is definitely different. Even inside what looks like a straightforward ISR lesion, there's probably neoatheroma. There's probably some thrombus. Um, you know, laser makes sense. I don't have experience with doing laser with embolic protection in vein grafts, um, but. Uh, it, it might make sense to ablate some of that thrombus that's inevitably there. Okay. I think we're on time uh, for the next uh, lecture. Thank you Great. so much. Thank you.